Welcome to Chapter 33, Care of Patients with Vascular Problems. The priority concepts are perfusion and clotting with an interrelated concept of inflammation. The chapter begins on page 697, and the next page, page 698, goes over hypertension. We all need a certain amount of blood pressure, but we don't want it to be too high, or that can cause problems. Hypertension is the most common health problem in primary care. Hypertension can cause stroke, MI, kidney failure, and death if not treated early or effectively. So for people over 60, we want it below 150 over 90. People that are younger than 60, we want it below 140 over 90. There are four systems that play a major role in maintaining our blood pressure. We have an arterial baroreceptor system. This is where the arterial baroreceptors monitor the level of arterial pressure and counteract a rise in arterial pressure. Regulation of body fluids is another control system. There are changes in blood volume and fluid volume that affect the systemic arterial pressure. If the kidneys are functioning adequately, a rise in systemic arterial pressure produces excessive voiding, which will cause a fall in pressure. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system plays an important role in regulating blood volume and systemic vascular resistance. Together, these influence cardiac output as well as arterial pressure. Then we have vascular autoregulation. This refers to the intrinsic ability of an organ to maintain constant blood flow despite changes in blood pressure. Essential hypertension. What do we know about essential hypertension? There uh, is no known cause, okay? It is also known as primary hypertension. This is the most common type of hypertension, and it results in damage to vital organs. It causes a thickening of the arterioles. Common risk factors include obesity, smoking, stress, and family history. If you look on page 700, table 33.2 shows you an etiology of hypertension, and on the left you have essential or primary hypertension, and on the right you have secondary hypertension. So again, if there's no underlying cause that is obvious, then it is known as primary hypertension. Um, if somebody has kidney disease or pregnancy or something like that, or even drugs can induce hypertension, um, but there's a known cause, then it um, is secondary hypertension. So again, secondary high blood pressure, secondary hypertension, is caused by another medical condition. Malignant hypertension, also known as hypertensive crisis, is a medical emergency. It is a severe type of elevated blood pressure that rapidly progresses and is considered a medical emergency. Symptoms include morning headaches, blurred vision, and dyspnea or symptoms of uremia. The hypertensive crisis criteria is a systolic blood pressure greater than 200 and a diastolic greater than 150 or greater than 130 when there are pre-existing complications. A patient in hypertensive crisis may experience kidney failure, left ventricular heart failure, and stroke unless treated promptly. The etiology and genetic risk of hypertension. Um, African Americans are more likely to have hypertension than others. If somebody has hyperlipidemia, they're older than 60 and they smoke, um, good chance that they will have high blood pressure if they have one or all of those. Um, obesity and physical inactivity also are risk factors. Secondary risk factors would be kidney disease. And again, you can look at table 33.2 on page 70, or excuse me, 700. Hypertension affects men and women. It is a worldwide epidemic. 
Um, most people older than 20 have some form of hypertension. And you can look at table 33.1, also on page 700, that goes over um, stage one and stage two, you know, how they categorize the different measurements. So how do we combat hypertension and what do we be, need to be teaching our patients about? Well, um, they're going to need to reduce their weight, reduce their caloric intake, and increase their exercise or activity um, if they are overweight. They can follow the DASH diet, which is a diet high in fruits, vegetables, and low dairy. We want them to reduce their intake of sodium for sure. They need to be eating less than 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day. And they need to increase their physical activity, which I mentioned. They can do aerobic, they can do resistance training, or they can do isometric exercises. How do we assess for hypertension? Very important that it's caught early. A lot of people don't have any symptoms. If they do have symptoms, they may have dizziness or flushing. Um, they may have headaches. You've probably heard of people who have a lot of headaches and they go and find out that they have high blood pressure. We would do a fundoscopic exam, which is where you check the eyes for vascular changes in the retina. You may also hear an abdominal brewy. If there is renal artery stenosis, which would be caused by uh, long-term hypertension. Psychosocially, you know, if people are very stressed, um, often someone who's taking care of a loved one who's very sick may develop hypertension or, or their hypertension can get worse. Sometimes students who are studying all the time um, and stressed out about school. So we want to assess coping strategies and help people um, to do everything they can to reduce their stress, to naturally reduce their hypertension. In looking at labs and things, there's not one lab that will tell you that somebody has hypertension. Mainly, you want to take the blood pressure in both arms, and the hypertension will be diagnosed after a series of blood pressures. Um, so if somebody has high blood pressure one time, they're not going to be diagnosed with hypertension. So either, you know, they come in the doctor's office and they have high blood pressure. Well, then they come in in six months and they have it again, or in three months or whatever and have it again. Um, the doctor also may tell someone to um, take their blood pressure every morning and write it down. And then over, you know, a period of time, usually a month, um, if it remains high the whole time, they'll diagnose them with hypertension. Urinalysis, you may see um, catecholamines. Um, there can be a tumor of the adrenal medulla, uh, which would cause catecholamines to be released, an elevation in levels of serum corticoids and um, ketosteroids in the urine. is also diagnostic of Cushing disease, um, which I think we touched on that, but you will hear more about that uh, next semester. There's really, there's no x-rays to show that you have um, high blood pressure, but you could determine if somebody has an enlarged heart, okay, so some heart failure or signs of some cardiac problems. Um, an EKG, you, the only thing you could really ascertain from that is um, as far as the blood pressure is just risk, you know, common um, risk factors or things that are that could be um, making the high blood pressure worse or vice versa. Okay, um, but an EKG is not going to show high blood pressure. Um, and let's see, um, you're going to look for protein in the urine, check the BUN and creatinine for kidney function, and of course we look at the um, red blood cells uh, to determine the amount of oxygenation and how well um, our organs are being oxygenated. When somebody has hypertension, it can cause a problem with that. Um, if your blood vessels are constricted and the blood's not flowing as it should, 
and you know your heart's having to work harder so there's not going to be um, the adequate oxygenation all the time that there should be. Page 702 to 705 talks about planning and implementation. What are we going to do for these patients? Or clients. The client with hypertension is expected to verbalize his or her individualized plan of care for high blood pressure, including lifestyle changes, complementary and integrative health. On page 703 and 704, it goes over the um, medical management um, as far as using drug therapy for hypertension. You have diuretics, you have beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, otherwise known as ACE inhibitors, and angiotensin II receptor blockers, or ARBs. So again, that's on page 703 in your text. There's a big, um, big chart at the top. Expected outcomes for these clients. Um, we, they are expected to adhere to the plan of care, including making, making necessary lifestyle changes. They've got to take their medications and they've got to know what to do in the case of a hypertensive crisis. And talking about home care management and self-management education, we always want the patient and family to be involved in the plan of care as much as possible. That increases their adherence to the plan of care, especially when we're talking about taking medications and becoming more active, watching sodium intake. I mean, all of those are, they're gonna be pretty major for somebody to do. Sometimes you have to kind of take one thing at the time um, and, and help them, you know, get over one hurdle or make one goal so they'll go on to, to do another thing. You should never ask someone to quit smoking, go on a diet, you know, and, and quit drinking beer all at the same time. It's not going to happen, I promise you. Okay, we need to urge the patients to report any unpleasant side effects re related to medication. Patients need to have a blood pressure monitoring device and you know they can pick that up easily at any pharmacy and they're not that expensive these days. You can get them very expensive but you can get inexpensive ones as well. And we want to make sure they understand about the sodium restriction, weight management, alcohol restriction, stress management, and exercise and that they need to stop smoking. Okay, evaluating outcomes. We want them to verbalize an understanding of the plan of care, report adverse drug effects such as coughing, dizziness, or sexual dysfunction, and consistently adhere to the plan of care, including regular follow-up visits with the primary care provider. What is arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis? Arteriosclerosis is a thickening or hardening of the arterial wall often associated with aging, so we're naturally going to have some arteriosclerosis as we get older. Atherosclerosis is a type of arteriosclerosis that involves the formation of plaque within the arterial wall. The leading risk factor for this is cardiovascular disease. And if you look on page 707, table 33.4, you will see risk factors of atherosclerosis. The pathophysiology, including physical manifestations such as elevated blood pressure, um, changes in the pulses, we want to assess for prolonged capillary refill, so how good is their peripheral um, perfusion, and then assess for brewies. So one thing to note is when we're talking about palpating pulses, never palpate both carotid arteries at the same time. If you do, your patient will pass out and you will freak out um, because that is blocking blood flow to the brain. 
This is figure 33.2 on page 707 of your text. And I really like these illustrations because it's so easy to see what the plaque does um, if you're not familiar with it. So you see at the top there, those are the little blood cells flowing through the normal artery. They're just cruising through, nothing sticking, there's no problems. Then when you have some plaque buildup, some of that cholesterol and fat buildup there, you can see how narrow that um, blood flow has become. Whereas at one time it went, you know, totally through that artery touching the walls. Um, now we have it constricted. So it's trying to make its way through the artery, but it, the artery then is not getting the oxygenation that it needs, is it? All right, and then if you look at the bottom picture, you can see where the fat has completely closed off the blood flow to the artery. In doing your assessment, I mentioned you want to take the blood pressure in both arms. You want to palpate the carotid arteries, but do it separately. Um, you want to look at capillary refill. Prolonged capillary refill indicates poor circulation. If you hear brewy, you may hear it in the carotids, you may hear it in the abdomen. Um, a brewy is a turbulent swishing sound that can be soft or loud in pitch. Breweries often occur in the carotid, aortic, femoral, and popliteal arteries. So I wasn't thinking about, for instance, the femoral artery, but you could also hear, possibly hear brewy there. Um, it is more likely that as a nurse you will be listening maybe listening to the carotids um, but you often will see for instance a cardiologist will listen to all the different areas for for brewery <clears throat> excuse me and of course we're going to look at the good and bad cholesterol so we can assess their risk factor for atherosclerosis interventions for these patients with arterio and atherosclerosis. Low risk people should have total serum cholesterol levels evaluated every four to six years. When you get over 40, you're gonna to need to be evaluated more frequently, especially if you have cardiac history uh, in your family. The modifiable risk factors, things that we can change are nutrition, activity, and medication therapy. Medication therapy, this is found on page 708. Now this is medication therapy to lower cholesterol. So the most common drugs prescribed are called statins. And you have a whole list of them there, lovastatin, atorvastatin, simvastatin, fluvastatin. Um, there are a lot of different statin drugs and that's a good thing because a lot of people are allergic to them or I should say they have side effects that they can't tolerate. A lot of people have bad muscle cramping in their legs. I mean, severe muscle pain um, where they will, they won't take the statin. I'd be like, nope, I'm done with that. Um, you have azetamide and you have combination drugs, which are azetamide with a simvastatin or a statin. Okay. You also have PCSK9 inhibitors. So the most important thing is that people need to make sure they are taking their um, cholesterol lowering medications um, consistently and that they are going to call the provider if they have any of those really difficult side effects. Now we're talking about peripheral artery disease, also known as PAD. This is a circulatory condition where your narrow your blood vessels are narrowed um, so it limits blood flow to the limbs so peripheral vascularly um, you're not getting a good circulation okay this includes disorders that change the natural flow of blood through the arteries and veins of the peripheral circulation causes decreased perfusion to the body tissues it affects the legs more than the arms it is a result of systemic atherosclerosis, and about 8.5 million people in the U.S. age 40 and older have PAD. It is really widespread. 
um, African Americans are affected more than any other group. On page 710, you have figure 33.3, .3, which shows you common locations of inflow and outflow lesions. Now, a lesion, what they mean by that is the blockage, the blockage in the artery, okay? When they're talking about inflow, these are people who have um, pain or discomfort in their lower back, buttocks, or thighs. When they're talking about outflow disease, they're talking about um, pain in the calf, feet, uh, and, and the lower legs, basically, okay? One of the keys to peripheral artery disease is called claudication, where when your client is walking, they'll notice that maybe they walk, I don't know, maybe they walk a couple blocks every day um, and they're used to that. Well, now all of a sudden they walk five minutes and they have a bad cramp in their leg. They stop and rest, it goes away. They walk five minutes, they get a bad cramp in their leg. It's the same spot, okay? Um, and so that, that's one of the indicators of peripheral artery disease. And sometimes it's an actual blockage, sometimes it's a narrowing. The stages of peripheral artery disease Stage one is asymptomatic. Stage two is claudication. Three is rest pain. In other words, they're still having pain when they've stopped walking. Um, and then stage four would be necrosis and gangrene. And if you look on page 711, you can see figure 33.4 in a necrotic toe there, necrotic great toe. Okay, and looking at signs and symptoms of peripheral artery disease, if you notice hair loss, um, the skin is usually dry and scaly, pale and mottled, toenails can be really thick, you may see um, signs of poor circulation, such as decreased capillary refill, and of course the muscle atrophy, um, gray, blue, or darkened skin, okay? The extremity also may be cold. Now, dependent rubor means that, let's say the extremity is cold and kind of um, bluish, maybe the tips of the toes are kind of blue, but then when you sit the patient up and they dangle their feet on the side of the bed, the, the bottom of their feet will be really red. That is dependent rubor. Your diagnostic assessment is going to consist of an MRA, which is... Um, something that they use to assess the blood flow in the peripheral arteries. Segmental SPB measurements. So we use a Doppler and assess blood pressure in the thigh, calf, and ankle. The thigh, calf, and ankle will have a lower blood pressure than the brachial pressure in the arm if somebody has PAD. Y'all may have heard of the ankle brachial index, ABI. This is the comparison of ankle pressure to brachial pressure. So you actually take a blood pressure on the ankle and then compare the two. Um, exercise tolerance training by chemical stress or treadmill provides information about claudication. So again, it's, it's just recreating that thing of them walking and after a certain amount of time, they have pain. They stop, it gets better, they start again, and after the same amount of time, they have pain again, okay? Then there's something called plethysmography, which evaluates arterial flow in the lower extremities. Page 711 to 713 talks about our interventions. For non-surgical management, we wanna talk about exercise and positioning, promoting vasodilation, drug therapy such as anticoagulation or antiplatelet agents, percutaneous vascular intervention, um, and arterial revascularization. Now, the invasive non-surgical procedures, they're used to diagnose and also to um, treat the arterial flow, to increase the arterial flow in the affected leg, okay? 
So much like a heart catheterization where they inject dye and look at the arteries, they can inject dye um, in the femoral artery and go down the legs as it's shown in um, figure 33.3. You can kind of see where that would, um, where the dye would flow. And then they use the fluoroscopy to, to see the, um, the lesions, okay? So on page 712, you have key features of lower extremity ulcers. And you can see pictures of different types. Um, those of you who have been in clinical have seen some of these. That one on the toe looks very familiar there, that first picture. As far as surgical um, management, arterial revascularization is a surgical procedure that is used to increase arterial blood flow in an affected limb. Now, what will happen with that is um, they will bypass the affected area, okay? So just like a coronary artery bypass, they can do this in other areas of the body as well. For instance, they can do an aortoiliac bypass or an aortofemoral bypass. In a bypass, the artificial tubes or grafts are placed near a section of the blood vessel that is blocked or narrowed. The graft creates a path so that the blood can move around the blockage. In this case, the grafts are placed on the aorta and the iliac or femoral arteries. This figure shows an axillofemoral bypass graft. This is on page 714, figure 33.6. And you can see that red tube on the right there going from the um, axilla all the way down to the femoral area. When you have an acute peripheral arterial occlusion, you're talking about acute limb ischemia. So this is a medical emergency. Acute limb ischemia is defined as a sudden loss of limb perfusion for up to two weeks after an inciting event. So this can occur in any peripheral artery of the upper or lower extremities. An embolus is the most common cause of a peripheral occlusion, and occlusions are more common in the lower extremities. In discussing arterial insufficiency, you may have heard of the six Ps. We're looking at pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, which is an abnormal sensation. Usually people describe it as pins and needles. It's usually caused by pressure on or damage to peripheral nerves. People may experience paralysis or poikilothermia which is just coolness. They just had to add one more P, right? The six Ps. Treatment must be initiated promptly to avoid permanent damage or loss of an extremity. How are we going to treat this problem? Obviously, again, prompt treatment is necessary to prevent permanent damage or loss of the extremity. They can perform a thrombectomy or embolectomy under local anesthesia. That will remove the occlusion. We want to monitor for compartment syndrome. This occurs when tissue pressure within a confined body space becomes elevated and restricts blood flow. This can lead to tissue damage and tissue death. A client may have an aneurysm of a central artery. A rupture is the most frequent complication and is life-threatening because of abrupt and massive shock results. A client may have an arterial aneurysm. This figure is 33.7 on page 717. These are common anatomic sites of arterial aneurysms. So you see how they can be anywhere um, along any artery. So up there in the shoulder, um, that's affecting the brachial artery. So they would have numbness in their um, arm, down their arm. Um, that isn't as common um, as I said a few minutes ago. It's not as common to have it in an upper extremity, but it can happen. Assessing aneurysms of central arteries. Sometimes a patient is asymptomatic. Sometimes with an abdominal aortic aneurysm, they have a gnawing pain. They uh, will be able to see a pulsation in the upper abdomen. It's not detectable until it's at least five centimeters in diameter. 
Rupture symptoms are severe sudden pain in the back, lower abdomen, um, and radiating to the groin, buttocks, and legs. Um, this is critical. They are at risk for hypovolemic shock caused by hemorrhage. Recognizing cues again um, for a thoracic aortic aneurysm. So this is in the thorax rather than in the abdomen. Back pain, shortness of breath, difficulty swallowing, not often detected, detected by physical assessment. And they may have a mass above the suprasternal notch. This is not very common. A TAA is not as common as a AAA, and they are frequently misdiagnosed. Management is determined by the size of the aneurysm um, and the symptoms that it's causing. Non-surgical management, a lot of times they monitor the growth and they may monitor it for years. Okay, often an aneurysm won't change for years, but they'll do frequent ultrasounds and CAT scans to monitor it. Um, also maintaining a proper blood pressure Okay, that decreases the risk of rupture. Surgically, they may have to go in. <clears throat> sometimes it's an elective procedure, and sometimes it's emergent. If you have a AAA that's rupturing, it's an emergency. Um, and it's called an aneurys aneurysmectomy. Say that three times fast. Aneurysms of the peripheral arteries are talked about on page 719. You don't want to palpate any mass that you see. Um, if you see a mass, and especially if it's pulsating, don't, don't mess with it. Symptoms are limb ischemia, diminished or absent pulses, cool to cold skin, and pain. Um, treatment is surgery, and if there's any sudden development or if of pain or extremity discoloration after surgery, that could indicate they have popped another clot and the limb is ischemic again. Aortic dissection. The aortic dissection is a medical emergency in which the inner layer of the large blood vessel branching off the heart, the aorta, tears. It's most common in men in their 60s and 70s. Symptoms include sudden severe chest or upper back pain that radiates to the neck and down the back, loss of consciousness and shortness of breath. Treatment includes surgery and medications such as beta blockers. This is a highly lethal emergency situation. Page 719 talks about aneurysms of peripheral arteries. Your assessment will show sharp, tearing, ripping, or stabbing pain that moves from the point of origin. The patient's usually diaphoretic. They're feeling pretty bad. Um, they are faint, nausea and vomiting, weak pulse, very apprehensive and anxious. Decrease in pulses peripherally and aortic regurgitation may be heard. Interventions, because this is an emergency surgery, we're gonna need two large bore IVs put in. We're going to give normal saline um, and any medications ordered. They're gonna need a Foley most likely, and subsequent treatment will depend on where the dissection is occurring. Peripheral venous disease on page 720. This is a circulatory disorder in which the veins that carry blood from the hands and feet to the heart become damaged or blocked. This can occur anywhere in the body. However, it most often affects the arms and legs and is commonly caused by a blood clot, often caused by defective valves. Um, also, if you have skeletal muscles that lack that contraction that helps to move the blood along in the right direction, um, that can be a cause of peripheral vascular disease as well. So the venous thromboembolus, all right, um, this is VTE is the current term that includes both deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolus. Um, if you look on page 720, there is a clotting concept exemplar on venous thromboembolus. So a thrombus is the blood clot, okay? The 
Glenothrombosis is a thrombus without inflammation. Thrombophlebitis refers to a thrombus that is associated with inflammation. So just think of the thrombophlebitis is phlebitis. There's going to be redness and warmth at the site, okay? Inflammation. Um, usually occurring in super, superficial veins, so you can see that redness and warmth. The DVT or deep vein thrombosis is um, it's the most common type of thrombophlebitis. All right, so you know we often talk about um, if somebody has a DVT, usually occurs in their calf, and one of the things that we will see is redness and warmth or somewhere in the lower extremity. But that um, will be something that the patient sees as well, um, as long as, as, as well as the pain, excuse me. With the PE, just in case you don't know, a um, blood clot becomes dislodged and travels up through the um, vascular system and into the lungs where it becomes a pulmonary embolus. Virchow's triad describes the three factors necessary for the formation of a thrombosis. So for the formation of a blood clot, you've got to have stasis of the blood. That means it's sitting there, pooling, not going anywhere. Vessel wall injury and altered blood coagulation. Some re risk factors predispose for venous thrombosis, while others increase the risk of arterial thrombosis. Millions of people are affected by peripheral venous disease, and unfortunately, many people die from pulmonary emboli. Okay, your assessment. Taking the patient's history, have they ever had a blood clot before? Do they have or have they experienced um, prolonged periods of sitting or bed rest? Have they recently had surgery? Or are there any other factors that could um, affect their coagulation, which would make them more susceptible to a DBT or VTE? Um, the Padua prediction score, this is the best available model for the assessment for the risk of VTE. It is meant to assess the risk, not to diagnose. All right, so it just talks about the risk. During the nursing assessment, one point is given for each of these characteristics, active cancer, previous VTE, reduced mobility, non-thrombophilic condition, a recent surgery, like in less than a month, an older adult, somebody over 70, cardiac or respiratory failure, acute MI, or ischemic stroke, acute infection, or rheumatologic disorder, obesity, and ongoing hormonal treatment. A score of four or more indicates that DVT is likely to occur. So the um, PPS scale is found on page 721. The patient may be asymptomatic. They probably will complain of calf or groin pain and there may be an on onset of leg swelling as well. So to diagnose these patients, we can do venous duplex ultrasonography, um, which is an ultrasound of the veins in whatever extremity is being um, affected. Doppler flow studies, an MRI, um, and the D-dimer test. And our nursing diagnosis would be potential for injury due to complications of VTE and anticoagulation therapy. Our non-surgical interventions would include patient education, leg exercises, early ambulation, graduated compression stockings or uh, TED hose, also SCDs, which they would have in the hospital, the sequential compression device venous plexus foot pumps, and anticoagulant therapy. Surgically, we can do a thrombectomy, which is a um, surgical procedure where they remove the clot. I think we talked about that earlier. 
Also, there is such thing as an IVC filter. That means inferior vena cava. So they place a filter um, into the inferior vena cava. This will prevent blood clots from moving through the blood into the lungs. Home care and self-management. We want them to stop smoking. We want them to avoid oral contraceptives. These increase the risk of DVT. So if somebody has had DVTs, we don't want them taking oral contraceptives. We want to give them instructions on self-injections of heparin or Lovenox, whatever they're going home on. Give them Coumadin education if they're on Coumadin. Now they're going to need to avoid contact sports because of their anticoagulant therapy. They also need to inform the dentist and any healthcare providers if they're taking any coagulant therapy. Avoid high fat and vitamin K rich foods. Stay hydrated, avoid alcohol, and of course, make sure they go for their follow-up appointments and lab draws. You can have venous insufficiency where you don't have a clot, but you have blood pooling um, because you have valves that aren't working properly um, you may have veins that are kind of stretched out because of prolonged hypertension. This will cause leg edema. And if you've ever seen um, somebody who has like a swollen calf and ankle area and their feet, and then you can kind of see um, some speckles or uh, raised areas sometimes even, or just little red marks around their ankles. Um, they can develop dermatitis where they become itchy um, and uncomfortable in that area. The skin changes. Um, they can also actually get ulcerations um, from those, uh, that blood just being static, not moving, okay? Non-surgical management, unless it's complicated by a stasis ulcer, obviously, if there's an ulcer, they may have to go in and debride it if it gets bad um, and that type thing. Varicose veins um, are usually not a problem unless they become really big. Um, they can be painful and they can rupture, but normally they are just protruding veins that are darkened and tortuous. Most people don't like the way they look. And some people have a whole lot of varicose veins. So treatment includes elastic compression hose, exercise, and elevation. And that concludes our lecture on chapter 33, vascular problems. Thank you.